thanks everybody for being here. Um, congrats to, uh, or thank you for stepping outside, seeing the weather that's out there and still coming to show up for this. We appreciate you. Um, we've got a great panel here. Um, I'll introduce them in just a second. Uh, but just agenda-wise, we've, we've got about an hour for the panel discussion. Um, I'll try to leave plenty of time for Q&A from you all. So, um, so I'll lead off with some questions and prompts just to get the conversation going. Um, but I, I want to make sure that I leave time for, for you all to ask your questions. Um, so yeah, we're, we're here to talk about um, the tech ecosystem um, and, um, and, and technology startups. And you know, one of the things that, that kind of came to our mind as we were thinking about um, uh, ideas for this, for this conversation um, is some of the influx of some of the bigger companies like Google um, uh, and, and others that are coming to the area, Apple, and what might that, how, how might some of those larger companies affect this ecosystem? Um, but at the same time, we don't want to completely narrow ourselves to that. There are some big picture topics that are affecting the area. Obviously, COVID um, and how that's changed the nature of work with, with um, working from home and, and virtual working and things like that. Um, there's also just the, the, the um, economic factors and the, and the workforce changes that have been happening. Um, such that you know, there's, a, there's a real uh, challenge with companies being able to hire effectively. And so how is that affecting the startup community? And how might some of these new entrants also affect um, the startup community? So we want to kind of hit on some of, those, uh, some of those ideas today. And so in, in my mind, kind of there are a, a few themes that I want to try to hit on uh, with you guys. Um, as we go through this, and, and in thinking about, first of all, talent. So, so what, are the, um, what are the major impacts to the talent base, and how might that affect the, the startup ecosystem, technology startup, startup ecosystem specifically, um, financing and funding for startups, um, and then also thinking about um, you know, things like diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, so developing culture within the startup ecosystem um, and how some of these larger companies might impact that. Um, and then also just kind of bigger picture things, sort of quality of life issues, cost of housing, traffic, and other topics. So we want to try to cover a lot of ground today, um, and hopefully we can get to as much of that as we can fit in in the time that we've got. So I guess I didn't introduce myself. I'll, I'll just briefly say, so I'm Jason Darty. I'm a, a clinical uh, professor here at the business school at Keenan Flagler. I teach in the entrepreneurship area and, um, and also work with the Entrepreneurship Center. Really excited to be able to host this panel with you all. And um, so I'll, I'll let you guys introduce yourselves, but really excited to have here Ray Trapp from the Research Triangle Foundation, Joe Colopy, um, who, uh, Many of you will know as the, as the founder of Bronto, um, but also as the godfather of Gretbeat, which um, many of you if, you, if you do know about it, you, you'll know instantly. If you don't, you should find out about it. And so I'll let Joe talk about that um, and some of the other work he's doing in the investment space um, in, in the technology ecosystem. And then um, Cade Ross from, from Bandwidth is here as well. Cade's been with Bandwidth for a long time and kind of seen that scale and growth and really watch this whole ecosystem um, build up in the time that he's been with Bandwidth. So thank you all three of you for being here and, and for your time today. So Ray, could you start off just with some quick, quick introductions? Yeah, absolutely. Very quickly, I am Ray Trapp, Vice President of Strategic Engagement for the Research Triangle Foundation. We are the stewards of Research Triangle Park. So what that means is that the municipality, which RTP is a municipality without being a municipality, we actually serve as stewards. So we present a budget, we tax the corporations within the park, and carry out the functions of the park. Six decades ago, when RTP was founded, the foundation actually owned all 7,000 acres. And of course, over time, we've done our job well, and we're down to probably about 400 or so acres that we still control. We do have first right of refusal on all parcels of land within the park when they are sold. But we want to do our job so well that we no longer own any land but the last 100 acres which we've identified for mixed use for hub RTP. Um, a little bit about myself, I am a 
like to say reformed elected official. I was a Guilford County Commissioner for two terms, and as I like to say, if the president can only be president for two terms, there's no reason for anybody else to go any longer. <laughs> so I started out saying I would do two terms and that would be it, and then I'd find a real job, and that's exactly what I've landed on. I'm a Navy veteran, and prior to that, real estate, so working for the Research Triangle Foundation kind of marries everything that I've done professionally up until this point. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thank you, Ray. Joe? Yeah. So my name is Joe Colopy, and it's my tech career in the Triangle uh, started about 25 years ago, and one of the key events, of course, is graduating from the MBA program here in 99. And subsequent to that, I was an early employee at Red Hat, and after that, started a software company called Bronto Software, which I was CEO of that for 15 years before selling that, which is now part of Oracle. So about five years ago, uh, with all my free time, I decided not to be busy, and I started two things. Uh, one of them is Gretbeat. So for those of you familiar with tech pub publications, uh, particularly TechCrunch and other ones in other markets, I thought there was a gap in this market, and so one way to kind of lift the triangle as a tech center is uh, not just more entrepreneurs, but more investors, but actually more media, more telling the stories. So I have a team of two plus a whole bunch of interns that write stories, do podcasts, do live shows uh, about the triangle tech community. And if you go to Grep Beat, for those of you who are old school Unix or maybe new school Linux programmers, which I expect that to be maybe none in here. Um, <laughs> it is G-R-E-P, which means parse, it's a parsing command, and beat, like beat the drum, dot com, and you'll subscribe to email, and it's really entertaining. So I am the deemed godfather because I financially support it. <laughs> um, the second thing I do is more recent is uh, I want to Bronto Software was a unique company in that we never raised outside capital. We were entirely bootstrapped, which is very unusual for a tech company to get a scale like that. And so a couple years ago, started something called Jurassic Capital, because Jurassic is where brontosauruses used to live, right? Get it? And we're looking for more uh, companies like that that we can invest in. And I have a partner and some interns doing that as well. And so, and that's pretty much what I do. Awesome. Uh, I'm Kate Ross, I'm the CEO of Bandwidth. I've been there for 20 years when I started. We had 13 people in a Regis office in Durham, and have since moved, I guess, eastward and are on NC State's campus now, at Centennial Campus. Uh, we've grown to about 1,200 employees. Recently, can, during COVID, uh, acquired a company called Voxbone. So we're international now, across 66 countries we offer our services. So that's been a lot of fun and excitement, seen a lot of growth over almost 20 years now. What Kay didn't mention is when they were in Regis, which is like a wee work of yesteryear, probably in Meridian Parkway, they actually had the they had a bigger office that had a window. And we moved the Regis of Bronto Software and we didn't have a window and we were very envious. We just had to live the high life with you and your window. We moved out yeah. right in. <laughs> These types of things die hard, you know. Uh, I I'm, I'm still hold a grudge. <laughs> As I walk by the hall, I can see out there window and see what the daylight looks like. <laughs> well, thank you for the introductions, guys. Um, I, I think I'd like to start with talent because I, you know, I think that um, irrespective of some of the the news around, you know, the 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 influx of, of Google and, and 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 Apple and others. Um, talent has always been top of mind in this ecosystem, I think, um, and it's you know becoming increasingly so. And I mentioned other trends as well, like with the pandemic and and the fluidity of of, of working from home. And you know we've we've seen even startups from the Bay Area move into this area. So it's it's not just some of these bigger companies, but um, so the, the 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 draw on the talent pool has been has been strong, and and I think will continue to grow. And so um, really interested just to see and and hear more from you guys kind of what you're seeing with that, and, and then hopefully we can talk about a little bit about like what are the solutions to that moving forward, and, and what should we be thinking about short-term and long-term for uh, managing the talent uh, scenario for the tech ecosystem. And, um, and I guess just to add one other flavor to that, maybe thinking about sort of like the uh, entry-level, mid-level stage, and also the leadership level, the kind of you know C-suite level in the startup community, that uh, startup context as well. Mm 
so Kate, I, I, I know that you're sort of in the, in the weeds with, um, with, the, with some of this stuff on a day-to-day -day basis, and so maybe we can start with you. That's sure, okay. happy to. Um, so I think it's, it is a very interesting time to be retaining talent. Um, it is expensive now to retain talent. We've had, and we typically grow folks from uh, our universities, and they don't always come with a you know, math or science or computer science background. We're hiring folks that are you know, straight out of a, a liberal arts degree. They may, may or may not have experience of what we do, and we try to train them into where we're at. I had an employee that's been here for less than two years, uh, starting out entry-level person, and recently lost him to a local, uh, I guess, quasi coming to be unicorn. And, you know, the inflation on his salary, he went from a very modest starting salary to something that was really, really aggressive. Probably about a 20, 20 I'd say probably about a 400% raise over the time when he was there. Wow. Uh, and we, we met in match, and he still decided to leave. Uh, and we're, we're well. <laughs> this is just one of the things that, that happens. We have to change our game as well. Uh, I'm not in a scenario where I feel like um, we're in a race for talent, but I don't think we're losing that race. I think it's just something that we're having to change over time. Um, when you say, how, how's that coming in? I think you know, all these larger companies coming in, it's a good thing for us over, uh, over the long horizon, over the short horizon, there's going to be some short-term pain. We have to figure out how to deal with that. Um, we're actively in the middle of that right now. Can you talk a little bit about how, um, how you solve that? I mean, is it a mix of, um, of, of salary and benefits, but also, like, is, is there more kind of um, uh, culture, culture building? And, and, and I'm thinking about, you know, like, DEI as a, as a piece of that as well. Sure. Um, like, what are, the, what are the inputs there for you um, guys? And, and I'm not the expert on this by any means, but we have kind of what we call a bandwidth, our whole person promise. We really care about culture and our employees and their well-being and trying to make sure that, you know, we kick people out of the office at 6 o'clock at night at, at the latest to go home and spend time with their families. I've been a beneficiary of that. When I originally started the bandwidth, I was you know, 21 years old. I didn't have a family and I would work all the time. And I kept seeing our CEO being like, hey, you need to go. Like, you've got a family at home. And so... Um, Originally, I was like, man, these guys are getting a free ride. Like, I can't believe they're doing that. And now that I have kids, I'm like, oh, that's great. Like, that's awesome. That's, that's really meaningful. So making sure that we keep a whole per a, a balance, right? Um, we're big on vacation embargoes. It's a real thing. We literally turn people's email off so that they can't check email and do things while they're on vacation. We force time off. Uh, we don't really let people roll time over. It's like, ah, oh, that sounds kind of bad. No, it forces people to, to actually take the time. So uh, I will tell you that we kind of slowed down a little bit in December because folks are like, oh, man, I've got 12 vacation days. I haven't seen you. Thanks for playing, right? Yeah. Enjoy that time with your family because I think you're, you're way more rested when you come back. So that's one way that we've done it is kind of force those things. You know, what else can we do for you, right? We try to try to tailor it for the individual as well. I think that's also very important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ray or Joe, do you, would you like to speak to, to kind of what you've seen with, with what companies are doing to retain? I mean, I think there's, there's recruitment, but then there's also retention. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the things that um, we're going to have to look at, um, I've been out with my manager of strategic engagement, and one night I came up with a plan that we would meet with all 300-plus companies in RTP, which sounds fine, but I said we would do it within 100 days. <laughs> <laughs> and... She didn't quit. She, it took her a couple of days and said, okay, well, let's plan this out and let's go through this and let's see. And so through that, we've met with about half. So we're halfway through. And this is a slide from what's important from them. 50% said talent was number one. 30% said diversity, equity, and inclusion was number one. So I think we're talking about the same thing. Yeah. It's diverse talent. I'm also on the state board of community colleges for the state of North Carolina. And we had a meeting talking about how to incorporate entrepreneurship into the community college system and make that a staple of the community college system. Lo and behold, I suggested that folks don't want to work at large corporations for 20 years anymore. Most of the board is a little seasoned, and they scoffed at that notion. Oh, well, I've just made 30 years at my corporation. And the other guy said, 
well, I've just made 27 years at my corporation. And I said to people that are younger than me, that's a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> that's why eShip excels. That's why these programs excel. I'm an alum of North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University, a and and our engineering students, by and large, also want to minor in business because they don't want to go work for large corporations other than the experience. They want to work for themselves. They also want to work for corporations that get it and corporations that care. So diversity, equity, and inclusion, of course, is important, but it's not just enough to have a diverse workforce and have diverse talent. But that B, that new B, which is DEIB, belonging. When I get there, do I feel like I belong? Is it not just a check on your box to say, oh, well, look at our progress. Look at what we've done. But are you truly making it an inclusive environment where I feel like I belong? So those are things that we have to look at. Talent is always going to be an issue. I know I used to look at WRAL and I'd hear these announcements, 55,000 tech jobs available in the triangle. And be like, oh, well, that's great. You know, folks can go to work. But for site selectors, that's not a great stat. They look at that and say, oh, well, you guys have had great announcements. You've had these great corporations coming in, but it seems like you can't keep up with the talent. Mm. We know that's not true. So what we have to do is tap into unconventional sources of talent. So we have to look at workforce development, true workforce development, looking at the community college system, making sure that we have intentional relationships with folks that truly haven't been at the table before. So that's what we have to do. And talent, and as I said, each one of these corporations that we've sat down, talent has always been an issue in RTP. The excelling employees do just what your employee did. <laughs> continue to match my salary, continue to match my salary, and I'm going to continue to go on to somewhere else. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily a bad thing. When I said at the State Board of Community Colleges that that's not what folks want to do and being somewhere for 30 years for me is a nightmare or for anybody in my generation that's a nightmare. We truly believe that three to five years is what you get and if I'm not progressing or not being promoted, then I'm an underperforming employee. That's what the world looks like to us. <laughs> so for every three to five years, there needs to be a career progression for me. So talent's gonna be something that we're gonna have to continuously figure out and we're gonna have to move with the time. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree, and 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 I do uh, I, I I do take your point about community colleges being a way to to train up and 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 bring forward a a, a workforce um, because I think about companies that are that are training internally. Um, there was a recent announcement in, in the Triangle Business Journal um, where a, a carry based company. I, th I think they're based in India, but they've got uh, you know. Um, uh, a presence in Cary, and, and they're looking to do like an internship, apprenticeship kind of a program internally. But then to your point, how do you, in, you know, how do companies invest in that if the employees they're training might be gone in three to five years? And so I think that it takes probably a mix of all of those things, but I do think that, um, you know, uh, the, the community colleges and the universities too, as, as you know, being more tactical and, 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 and training people for, um, you know, vocation per se, but, but being work ready uh, when they come out of school. Um, yeah, great. So um, what about at the leadership level? Um, so and, and, and thinking about, um, you know, at the C-suite, um, there, you know, some, some would say that historically perhaps, and, and I think this is changing over time, um, and maybe Joe, you can, you can speak to this some from what you've seen, but um, historically in this area, um, it may have been harder to attract C-level talent at some of these well-funded startups with the idea that, you know, if things don't go well, or even if it goes well and the company exits, what's my, what's my next, where am I going next? And if there isn't a, a critical mass of other opportunities in the region, um, people might be less likely to come to this area to take that position. And so um, do having, you know, now, now Google, now Apple, and this robust, much more robust ecosystem of, of well-established companies. Um, does that change the game for being able to attract kind of C-level talent here? And have uh -oh. you seen that so far? Yeah, so coming to talent, I do, I think it definitely impacts the early startup, like a founder, to very large companies, tens to hundreds of thousands of people. And I think particularly this topic you're bringing up when companies get to kind of mid-size, 
like there are 100 people, and then they start getting to thousands of people and bigger, you have to start uh, having more mid-level and senior people. And one of the challenges that we've often had in this area is we don't have a plethora of that like you might have at Silicon Valley because there's just tons of these big companies rolling around. We might have it in certain industries, but we don't necessarily have it all in tech. So it's more likely we need to recruit people here from all over the US. And for these jobs, people are willing to move. But these are people at different stages in their career. And so when they often are partners, they often have families. And so when they move, they can't, they're not as flexible as when they were like 22, right? If it doesn't work on 22 in two years, they can't just go somewhere else and, and just jump in like, oh, it's another new adventure. You know, they have a lot of other considerations. They have their partner, they have their kids, their kids in school, and they don't have to move them again. And as that becomes more senior, that becomes more relevant. So they start looking at other factors that are really important. And one of those other factors is, hey, one, um, my partner, if there is one, there often is, um, where is he or she going to work, right? And is there a number of jobs? So if it doesn't work out for them, like they have options, you know, and whether at the university level, you know, they're working at Duke, and of course that won't work out because that's a god awful place. <laughs> <laughs> they find their way to Carolina or, or wherever. You know, and so, um, so that's very, very relevant, right? And it's also very relevant, it doesn't work out for them, they have places to move. And I think one of the most uh, valuable things that comes from the announcement of Apple announcing and building a huge campus, and I think it's in the Cary area, and Google setting up shop in downtown Durham, is not only does that give kind of external validation, it's like, oh, the Triangle is the place to be. You know, those are some known names, because we've had other big companies, they're just not as fancy sounding, right? So there's a lot of marquee value to that. But also that marquee value translates through. So when bandwidth or Pendo or one of these other kind of high flying startups in the area is like recruiting a mid level executive, they're not like, geez, this is a one shot. That's it. You know, if it doesn't work out, then I have to kind of go, right? What else am I going to do, right? And so having those things, knowing that, oh, wow, that's Google's there, Apple's there, whatever, whatever, uh, is, is very, very very, very helpful. And also, it works the other way, too, in that those companies, they bring people, right? And maybe it's not so great working at Apple, right? And then they spin out and are this awesome director at whatever one of these really growing companies that's hundreds of people, that's 500 people, it's soon going to be 5,000 and then 50,000. Um, and we need to fuel that. And we fuel all these companies really with people, um, their knowledge-based industry. So, it really adds to the exchange in a very direct way, even more so than at the tiny little startup level, at the mid and larger level, it really is critical um, to, to really fuel in that engine. And, and, and so I just, so with respect to that, um, not just filtering down to sort of like similar leadership level positions within companies, but, but also spinning off and, and, and doing new venture development as well, right? Would you, would you say that that's a, a, a potential as well? Yeah, it's a potential, but also put caveats, it depends, Yeah. right? So if you have a company like Red Hat, right? It's based here, it's publicly traded, they have a very open culture. You've seen uh, not just literal spin outs and literal acquisitions, like Ansible's good example, something that was spun out and acquired locally, but also just very talented people, right? I stayed in this area because of Red Hat, and then I went off to start something, right? So I had no connection to Red Hat, but just it's just a magnet for, if I may say it myself, talented people. Um, <laughs> but so there's we'll let you say it. Exactly. But there's definitely there's definitely that um, there there definitely is that element. But it depends on the culture of the company, right? So the best we can do is get HQ ones. HQ ones means the headquarters of the company. Mm. The second best we can do is HQ twos, which is what, or three or, four, or whatever you call it, which is what Apple is and Google is, mm. right? So um, if you have a company like SaaS, and SaaS is a wonderful addition to this thing, but they're actually not culturally spinning off from the sun, right? But overall, um, it does help. Um, some companies are more like that than others. Some cultures are more like that than others, and it kind of depends. Um, but even if you use the Red Hat example, which has been a huge success era, uh, story, started technically in like the early 90s by a software engineer who was a recent graduate of Carnegie Mellon, recruited through one of their IBM training, early grad programs, to IBM. 
if we didn't have IBM here, mm-hmm. and that decision was made in 1960 or 50, whenever they started plotting that, 30, 40 years later, we would not have Red Hat. And with Red Hat, we wouldn't have, and you could just spider out from there. Yeah. So these things have, if you could draw a tree, indirect consequences that a lot of people don't realize that fuel the economy in ways that will pay dividends 30, 40 years down the road. Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned visibility, and I'm thinking about, um, thinking about the historical context of like we've had, you know, IBM has been here for a long time, Cisco, you know, there are big companies here that have been anchors um, of this area for a long time. Um, does, and, and you spoke to it to some extent, um, what Google and Apple are bringing right now, how much that changes the optics for this area. Um, but, I, but I am wondering, like, do, does, do you anticipate some additional follow-on from other companies who just, rec- just see like there must be some cachet to this area um, that they didn't otherwise recognize from you know, the Forbes rankings that we get and the you know, best places to live kinds of stuff that, that we have been doing for a long time? Um, do, you know, do you see a direct impact from, from having the Googles and Apples um, you know, put, a, put a stake in the ground here? I, I do. I mean, I, I think one is you're only as good as what you did today, right? So in the 90s, and I don't know if this influenced bandwidth at all, but one of the really big companies that we had here that was HQ2, which is a huge presence, was Nortel. And that blew up. Right. Like, no one talks about Nortel anymore. It's not mm. a present, you know? And that was a huge employer. So we have to, Cisco might decide that they want to, like, not be here anymore, right? We we are constantly have to fuel that pump, right? And so... Apple and Google are like the next addition to that. So I think overall it definitely helps. I think those things help in very indirect ways. They're sometimes very hard to measure, but they're high profile names and I think they definitely matter. And then there's, they really deploy people, which does kind of fuel the economy um, as well. And so, yeah, I, I think they're definitely impactful. You know, the reason I'm in North Carolina and I'm very talented, which I mentioned earlier, <laughs> um, is. Because my wife and I, we were living in South America, and we had just read, like, where do we want to move in the U.S., you know, and, uh, and we were flipping through, and we just heard, and through magazines, a lot of great things in Raleigh-Durham. We'd never been here before, right? And so it was through those random rankings uh, that, you know, they have impact in a lot of different ways. And so having that PR at the great place to live or work, those ripple through, People seeing like, oh, Apple and Google is there. In my company, we went through two significant uh, acquisition offers. One was with Salesforce.com out of San Francisco, which we didn't do. The second one was with NetSuite, which is also Silicon Valley, now part of Oracle. And in the first one in 2009, they, um, they had all these stereotypes in terms of what North Carolina was. The guy told me that, like, you sound like John Edwards. It's like... I'm not even from North Carolina, right? <laughs> like, like, but whatever. Like, they had a very limited view, right? So they did not have a realistic view that this is some place they could set up a different location because of stereotypes, right? Fast forward 2015, and we're in downtown Durham, and that had changed a lot in that period. They, they had a very different view uh, for various reasons of what this area was about, and they were very excited about building operations there. Um, in terms of what that could be. So these stereotypes that people have, they do so much so that they stayed at 21C. And we're all coming from San Francisco. And they thought that was inappropriate and too much for, compared to what their San Francisco worst perspective was. So if you've ever stayed at 21C and walked around, you might get a sense of what I mean if you see some of the pictures. Um, so it's just very interesting that those little impressions, as much as it's science, um, it's not always that way. And then if you look at, for example, Apple's leadership today, uh, they all made the mistake, many of them made the mistake of actually spent time at Duke, right? And so that they, because they had those early experiences and they didn't have preconceived notions they're hanging out in the tobacco fields, which sounds ridiculous, but some people do have that when they're coming from far away. Um, it probably made this an acceptable idea and kept it on the list. And then I'm sure it went on its own merits, right? So um, it, Having high-profile names, bringing high-profile business leaders in this area and validating it has a lot of ramifications. Some that are direct and some that are very indirect, but they have real impact in the area. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Um, I'd like to switch gears a little bit to think about um, the potential, if any, for more kind of direct interaction between some of these larger companies and some of the startups that are here, whether it's as customers or suppliers, one way or the other. Um, I mean, we've talked about sort of like what's going to happen with talent kind of switching between them or, you know, whatever, uh, or competing against each other for talent. Um, but what about opportunities to collaborate, to be customers, partners, um, you know, strategic partners in some way, maybe co-development of, of, of things, um, and, and then potentially, you know, are there opportunities? To, uh, we, we talked a little bit more about like on the spin-off side of things, um, but, but what are you guys seeing there, and, and, and are there opportunities for some of these smaller companies to take advantage of having some of these larger companies in our backyard? Yeah, I'll, um, I've got to get a stat because I had someone pull this for me today, and it shocked me because when I think of RTP and the Research Triangle Park, I think of large corporations. There are 300 there, but when I look at our breakdown, only 20 have 250 plus employees mm. out of 300 plus, only 20. 21 are 50 to 250 employees. 260 are from one to 49 employees in RTP. Wow. And when we talk to our large companies, all 20, which we've talked through on this 301 campaign, what they love is the fact that they can have cross collaboration. So it's back to what you're talking about. So when we built Boxyard, which we talked about a little earlier, it's the first time ever in RTP that you can actually eat within RTP. Hub RTP is going to be our mixed use project. It's the first time that you can ever legally live in RTP. I won't say this is the first time that folks have ever lived in RTP, but it's the first time that you can legally live in RTP. But what we get overwhelmingly is that opportunity for cross collaboration to just bump into someone at Boxyard while I'm having a beer from Fullstein and start to have a conversation and then say, oh, well, what do you do? And then go from, oh, well, this is what I do. And you not know who you're talking to. And so those unintentional types of sparks, I think that's what the large corporations look for. And I think that's what we buy and far. And also that validation of being here, being located in this area for industry <clears throat> validates them. For the smaller companies we talked to, the 260 of them, what is it, why did you choose to come to the Research Triangle Park? Why did you choose this area? And for a lot of them in certain industries, in tech industries and in life sciences industries, they said just having that address immediately validated me. Mm -hmm. So whether I have two employees and I have a 250 square foot office, when it says RTP NC 27713 or 27709, or if it says Morrisville, or if it says Cary, if it says Raleigh, I'm immediately validated. So those are the things that they want, and those are the things that I think the large corporations bring and build to this area, especially with the small, smaller corporations. And also the universities, the universities that are here. They continuously want the universities and that collaboration with the universities in higher education. That's why they consistently choose this area. Piggyback on what you said, um, so our co-founder, now CEO, was in a spare bedroom in Park City, Utah, and our uh, other co-founder was here, uh, was a former power trader, doesn't really make a difference, but they came together, and the thing that they were trying to decide, like, where are we going to start this company? We kind of have an idea of what we're going to do. RTP carried it. You're like, well, you weren't even based in RTP. We got a P.O. box in RTP because it mattered. There you go. He was in Park City, he knew what RTP was. Yeah. You know, because of the universities, it mattered. Yeah. Uh, and then you talked about you know what you're doing in Boxyard. That's a model that's been successful here. You know it. You're based there for a long time. It's called American Tobacco. It's called Durham. Yeah. Durham. You're doing it all over again. It's the right thing to do. Um, we've been courted to go to Durham for years. We're not done with you yet. It's an amazing thing. So I think kudos to what you're doing. But it, it, you're right. It doesn't matter. It is validation. Absolutely. And a I, number of years ago, I had a friend come to this area, about 20 years ago, and he's like, I really want to see RTP. Can we go to RTP? I'm like, uh, okay. <laughs> oh, he's like, where is it? He like, Eiffel Tower or something right. like that. I'm like, uh, okay, here you go. Yeah, it had, it, it's been, so for us in 2015, and where the frontier is and where Hub will be, 
that was an old IBM campus. And IBM scrapped it, they had no need for it. And we actually were gonna scrap all the buildings and add it on to the 100 acres that we had and just package it together. Mm -hmm. And along the lines, we had a leader that said, hey, well, let's not do that. You know, let's make this a co-working space that's absolutely free to use for those unintentional types of bump-ins and collaborations. So we still have that space that's free in RTP. The space that you rent out is relatively inexperienced. We call it cheap and cheery. That's exactly what it is, it's cheap and cheery. But you have an RTP address, back to validation. And so all of those things make a difference. Even with Boxyard, um, our CEO calls that a project only a foundation can love. It's $9.5 million of investment with no ROI, dollars and cents. But it's an amenity for the park and it's an amenity for the region. And that's it. That's the ROI. In it. Yeah, that's, that's right. So what are the things that we can do? Because I, I totally agree with, with um, you know, creating unexpected collisions of people, right? And, and sort of like what can come out of a conversation you weren't expecting to have kind of thing. And I think that what you're talking about, what you're doing in RTP, does that from a physical space perspective. I think Gretbeat does that from a building a, an online community. It's essentially, and a, and a newsletter. yeah, the whole idea of telling stories yeah. is to create density in a in a storytelling virtual way, right? Um, which is another way of when someone says, "Oh, what's going on in the Research Triangle Park or the Raleigh Durham area, the Triangle in terms of tech? Go here. Oh, and they see all this stories. Wow, there's a lot, and there's a lot of intersections of stories and." We'll put this about people, and so that's very much that's exactly the idea of why we do it. Yeah. So, so what are what are who else needs to be involved, and what are some other ways that we can sort of like ensure that that kind of thing is happening, um, and we're maximizing the opportunity, basically. I mean, I think the universities can play a role in that to some extent, um, and. Um, you know, but I'm just curious if you have other ideas of sort of like where are the gaps, where where are the th what are the things we're not doing well, maybe that other ecosystems are doing better. Well, <laughs> I think let's just talk about universities, right? And it's the kind of thing where it's tough for universities to always get very tied in with the local economy, right? But uh, I think they can always do better. It's just inherent to what they are. So I think events like or talks like this. And particularly at the business school level, um, you see a lot of those kind of connections, uh, connecting in different ways with the larger companies on very specific topics that are relevant to them, or mid-sized companies or small companies, and hosting events and create connections between the students at different levels and uh, the companies. I, I think there's a lot there. I think, um, I think UNC does a, a pretty good job, I think, NC State's actually doing a better and better job, a pretty impressive job. They've, and I think, not to knock on Duke again, but like Duke is much more siloed actually in that regard. Yeah. And so I think, uh, particularly as public universities, I think that's really, really important. But I think it's, it's kind of never enough, right? And, and so I think doing a lot more of that is, uh, is really critical. But uh, you know, at some level, it depends who you ask. Like if you ask most investors, they'll say, hey, we need more great entrepreneurs. To create more entrepreneurs, like we need more investors, right? And so, and that's, they're both right, mm -hmm. right? And so, it's a little bit of like there's no magic bullet. We just need lots of bullets all over the place, and the more the merrier. And we need to keep on doing it and like amp it up, and not really kind of rest on our laurels. And um, at the same time, and we haven't really talked about this part is, as much as Silicon Valley kind of has that going on, and now Austin is like the second one, like they've got real problems too. Right, and so there are. There's definitely a flip side, and and those we're not immune to those problems. So it's not like oh, come to the triangle because it's not Silicon Valley, not Austin, and because we will just run into those problems as well. And so I think where we really need to is be smart, smart, and in front of how we do development. And you know, there's a lot of talk about housing and stuff like that. So it's not just having better jobs for people who don't already live here or the people can't afford to live here. And so I think that is a governmental response and seems more ancillary uh, to startups, but is very relevant because if people, we, we want the activity, but we also want people to be able to live here. You know? And I think finding that balance is something that's very hard for a startup or individual company to like solve that problem. But I do think at a governmental level and a university level, 
they are kind of a little bit above it and that they can start trying to help figure out the, look at the case studies from these other places, what they did right, what they did wrong, and like bring that into the community and influence policy in a very positive, positive way. Yeah. I'll take my <clears throat> second home of Atlanta. I went to middle school and high school in Atlanta as a case study for good and bad. So good, anyone here from Atlanta, live in Atlanta? So when someone says, you're from Atlanta, or I'm from Atlanta, the following question is, where? <laughs> because what Atlanta has done well in marketing is managed to convince the entire world that 80 square miles around Atlanta is still Atlanta. <laughs> so much so that the Atlanta Braves play 45 minutes away from actually Atlanta. And no one questions it. So for us, I think that's the thing that we have to do. I see these memes all the time, Raleigh Durham's not a place. Okay, who cares? <laughs> you know, <laughs> no one cares. Only your regional bias will get you in trouble every time about what a place is called. Site selectors don't care. Folks that come here to go to school here don't care. So I think Atlanta has done an amazing job with that, of convincing the entire world that everywhere around there is Atlanta, and everyone else has bought into it. Second thing on what they've done bad is transportation. I will never live in Atlanta again. I've been offered jobs ever since I graduated from grad school to move back. We'll never live there again because of traffic. It can literally take you 45 minutes to go two exits. And it doesn't matter what time of day it is. It doesn't matter what time of night it is. So those are the conversations that we have to have. When we've been meeting with companies within the park, COVID's lulled people in the triangle into a false sense of transportation is not an issue anymore. Oh, it's not on our radar anymore. Everything is fine. Well, think back to pre-COVID. And I know for me, looking, going to Jones Street to lobby and looking at Page Road and all those RTP exits and thinking to myself, good God, I'm glad I don't have to get off at any one of those exits. <laughs> well, now I do. <laughs> but thanks to COVID, it's ramped down. And so people are like, oh, we're never going back to the office. Uh, yes, we are. We had $4.5 billion of investment in RTP last year for office space, and you can guarantee it's going to be used. <laughs> so we are going to be flexible, and the world will continue to be flexible, but we are going to return to the office eventually, especially when C-suite people and other folks start looking at efficiency rates. We've managed to swim during COVID, and we've managed to be flexible and look at things on who can work from home and who can't. But when we look at efficiency rates, yeah, we're going to be back in the office. When we look at building culture, you can't build culture through Zoom or WebEx or Microsoft Teams or any of those. You build it in here, having these conversations, and you build it in the office. So we are going back. So I'll show those conversations. We have to continue to have the transportation conversations. Light rail, bus rapid transit, whatever it is, who cares? Just figure it out. We don't want to own the solution. It's a mix of everything. Ride share, it's all a mix of everything. But good God, before we end up like Atlanta, let's have these conversations. No knock on my second city either. <laughs> <laughs> we, you, you, you guys have both hit on a couple of um, funding in one, in, in one instance and sort of quality of life, traffic, housing. So those things have come up. I'm also trying to be cognizant of time, though. I want to make sure that we open things up to the audience. So. Uh, maybe there'll be some questions along those lines. If not, maybe I can come back in with a couple. But um, yeah, I want to make sure that we have time for, for questions from you all. So um, please, anyone have questions for the panel? Yeah, please. I'll try and let students go first, but uh, <laughs> there's only so much time I'm going to <laughs> uh, Hello, Shelly Terry, Branding and Licensing for UNC. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, you already kind of started on the question I had. I was just interested, particularly when you talk about so many of the companies having less than 250 employees and, and maybe being a little bit smaller and understanding the considerations about um, the cost of living in that area. Um, are, are there one or two things that are kind of floating out there? Uh, like while other people, while students and others are working to maybe do things for the future, kind of what's in place now? Yeah, I think we've started to look at inclusionary workforce housing because 
great jobs and great announcements are great, but who's going to keep the lights on? And if they have to make a two-hour commute from Johnson County, which is the largest growing county in the state, understandably why, because of the cost of living is a little bit less and the commute isn't that bad. But if we can't figure that out, it's back to the problems that we're going to have that these other places have. People see these great announcements, and it means opportunity. It's something that I can take advantage of. But if I have to live two hours away, I can't take advantage of that. And so we have to completely figure that out. Whenever I look at home prices and whenever I get an alert from Realtor.com about price increase in Durham, and I look at it and it's 100000 above asking or something like that, it frightens me. Because what we lose is we lose our advantage for the corporations that are choosing this area. If our home prices are just as much as Silicon Valley or Boston or Austin or anywhere else, that's an advantage that we lose. And so we have to figure that out. So it's working with policymakers and figuring out how to make it work. Um, government shouldn't figure it out, but they should have policies that make it a little easier. It's not the place of government to completely figure it out. It's for corporate to figure it out and to make it work and then bring those policies and work with government to implement those policies to make it work. So that's just where we are. But we are having conversations about that. Yeah. Uh, my name is Igor Bobrashov. I was listening uh, carefully about the talent shortage uh, issue and the partnership and collaboration between the companies. So the question came to my mind, uh, we need to find a way to compensate talent shortage somehow, right? And one of the ways probably is to uh, use some service provider companies, like outsourcing companies maybe in India and Eastern Europe, right? Uh, is, like, do you see the trend in increasing demand in, this, in those services? And uh, do you see a need in kind of networking? Because um, Vendors are different, right? And some are better quality, some are worse quality, and it's hard to see, hard, hard to measure them without, you know, getting direct feedback from somebody who partnered with those vendors. So, is RTP a good place to, you know, to build some kind of network and to to find the right feedback to any of the vendor that you would probably use? Yeah, I think it has a place. Right, and I think it filled the gap. And so what we're talking about is um, what time horizon we're looking at for certain things, right? So I was talking about a talent shortage for us. Yes, we're using outside development to help that. Some of that is, some of that's onshore, some of that's offshore, some of that's what we call nearshore. So it's even you know, it's a combination of the two. Um, but that's not a long-term solution for me. That's a short-term build. Uh, the thing for me that makes a big difference, and we kind of haven't talked to you, you talked to a little bit because you're on the board, mm -hmm. but community colleges are a big piece of the puzzle that we're not really paying a lot of attention to. Mm -hmm. We've got some of our best best and brightest folks. Um, we're, we're white tech folks. They didn't do the four-year thing. That's they right. Us, and they've been excelling. They're, they're, they're managers now. They're moving up through the ranks. And that's something I think we should really be taking advantage of. But I, definitely there's a place for that. And I, we, we use it in our business every day. All right. Well, I think that's time. So um, let's all give a big round of applause. For <laughs>